Hi everyone, my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Board Game Video. Yep. Uh, and so today, this is going to be a pretty straightforward, uh, quick, maybe quick one, because we're just going to be talking about games. Yep. We have, we have uh, five different games that we want to talk about. Yes. They are all here, and we should go one by one. Yeah, I think there's a theme usually. So today's theme is two-player games, because recently we've been uh, able to play mainly two-player games just right. because of our schedule and circumstance. So you might as well just start with the smallest box. Sure. All right. So our first game is Abstract Academy. Now, this one is a little bit uh, cheating because it's not strictly a two-player game. You can right. play this at two or four. And it's designed by Molly Johnson, Sean Stankowick, and Robert Melvin. This is uh, published by Flat Out Games here in the U.S. And uh, like Monique was saying, it is a two or four player game, mm -hmm. but it's not a team based game when you play it at four. Correct. It's still it's competitive no, no matter what. Mm. And uh, the premise here is everybody has uh, cards that have different configurations of three different colors, yellow, red, or blue. Mm -hmm. And so there are four quadrants on the cards. Some of them might have more of one color. Others might have all, all three. It's a various and random kind of assortment of different colors on these cards. Yes. The game is played over the course of three rounds. And each round, we're going to be building a, uh, a grid in the center of the table that everybody kind of shares. At four players, the grid is going to be bigger. At a two-player game, it's going to be smaller. But once the grid is basically finalized, then the two rows that are closer to you are going to be the rows that you're going to be scoring for yourself. Mm -hmm. And each round, there are going to be different scoring conditions, such as having the largest red area or having the most number of yellow spaces, stuff like that. And it's all going to be dependent on the um, distribution of the colors that are in your scoring rows. Yes. So what, what happens is you're going to be placing cards out, trying to build up what you're able to score. Right. Uh, but you can also kind of put a damper in seeing what your opponents are going to be able to score by mm -hmm. placing cards that you know are going to be less opportune in their sections. Exactly. Exactly, because when you place the card out, you can literally place it anywhere mm -hmm. until the grid lines have been drawn. Once the grid lines have been drawn, you can no longer place cards in your uh, opponent's home row. Right. Just because that would that would make the game even more chaotic than right. it already is. Mm -hmm. And each player also has a private scoring condition that has to do with forming a specific shape on mm -hmm. your uh, your scoring area. And uh, each round, you can score one of those, but each round, you're also going to get another one of those. Right. It's in your best interest to try to score it every single round, yes. but sometimes the way the cards play, you're not going to be able to. Yeah. And that's the basic gist of the game. There's also a little bit of uh, whoever's a teacher's pet gets to choose the order of the scoring conditions that you score in. Yeah, that's right. And so that that is also part of the strategy. But that is the basic gist. You're creating this grid of abstract cards and trying to score points for your scoring your scoring rows. I found the game to be interesting, but very chaotic. Mm -hmm. So we played it both at four players and at two. two yep. The first time we played it was a four player game. And the four player game is extremely chaotic, a little bit too much so, right? Yeah, in a four player game, you're you're trying to build out a five by five grid uh, all together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you get one in every four turns. So sometimes like things are just building out and you're like, I did not have any control over what I'm seeing right now. Mm -hmm. I guess this is my territory here. I'm going to try to make it the best I can. Right. Um, and your scoring yeah. rows in a four-player game are are even more kind of strange because everybody takes a different edge, edge. of the 5x5 five five grid. Mm -hmm. So when you play a card, you're, you're potentially playing a card for two different scoring rows. Yep. Meaning you're playing the card into the scoring conditions for different, two different players. Right. I, I, I kind of like that part of it, but it's also just super chaotic. It's hard to control anything. It's it's hard mm -hmm. to plan for anything, even the private scoring condition in your own hand. Yeah, it's hard to create that. And if you miss out on one and somebody else gets theirs, then it's kind of has a snowball effect of this person now just shooting up in points. Yeah, without with you not being able to catch up because you can only score one of those per round. Per round, yeah. And so, how did you feel about the two player experience? Uh, two player experience, I guess, is a little bit better because it's a little bit more controlled. Obviously, it's like it's your turn, then it's my turn, so I can do some control. Uh, but it still had the same kind of effects. Like uh, once we we divided kind of the grid, it was just kind of like, okay, now I'm just going to try to score as best as I can. And I didn't really feel like uh, there was too much strategy going into there. Mm -hmm. It was just like, well, I have this large mass of yellow and clearly the scoring card says get the most yellow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, yeah, I'll definitely place this right here. So mm -hmm. uh, there was kind of like this rush to the center because there's th there's nothing on, on the table at first. So in two-player game. Yeah, you start to just kind of build, build. And once you've established that four-by-four four grid in a two-player game, 
like clearly I'm just going to always want to play the, the, the things that are going to be the best case scenario for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know, there wasn't too much depth in that sense yeah. uh, for me. Yeah. I can see this being like a good like lunchtime game or like if you want to just like, you know, do a little 10 minute something, then, you know, you can definitely pull this out. Uh, Although it is longer than 10 minutes. It, yeah. You're playing three yeah. rounds. Um, That's right, yeah. But, but it, is, it is one of those games where it wants you to play both offense and defense. But I, I, I agree with you. The strategy in it is not super interesting Mm -hmm. so in the end i know i'm i'm a pretty big fan of the other kind of uh, puzzly games that flat out uh, comes out with but Mm -hmm. this one is is just not for us so next up we have a dr finn title yeah steve finn he's one of my favorite designers and this one is nunga parbat this one came highly recommended by rado when we did a video with him a little over a year ago yeah uh he had just played it a lot and i guess he was he was really really excited for it so took us a while to finally get it played but we have played it a handful of times and we want to talk about it today. Yes. So this is two player only. Um, mm-hmm. In this game, players play as members of the Sherpa community. We're going to be building base camps on uh, the six different mountains that are featured on the board and uh, trapping animals as well, placing the animals on our player boards. Each uh, specific type of animal has a specific uh, bonus ability that you can take on your turn. Kind of breaks the rules. Slightly. Yeah. yeah. So gameplay is simple. On your turn, you're going to take an animal from the mountain where the main yellow hiker is mm-hmm. and place that animal on your player board in its corresponding space. You then replace that animal with one of the uh, meeples of your own color and then you could potentially do some of your uh, animal abilities if you have animals on your board you can also score some points which we'll talk about and you always end your turn by moving that yellow hiker to the numbered mountain of wherever you took the animal from yep. if that makes sense yeah and then it becomes the next player's turn and yeah. the same decision kind of point is there okay from this new mountain which animal am i going to take do i right. want to collect the same type of animals do i want to get a wild assortment but yeah. i'm also trying to be aware of where I'm placing out my Sherpa meeples because you want to try to build up encampments so that you can score more points in a different way. So the way that you can score points is by either turning in sets of animals or by building your base camps. So animals are going to be either a certain number of the same type of animal or Mm -hmm. different types of animals. And all the scoring conditions are at the top left-hand corner of the board. And if it's your turn and you can claim one of those scoring conditions and you place your cube on that scoring Mm -hmm. uh, parameter and you get to score those points immediately, and only one person's cube can be on each of those spots. So it's kind of a competition. If I take the spot that allows me to turn in three of the same type of animal, then now Naveen can't take it. And the other way that you can score points is by building base camps. And you can only build base camps on your turn if you have meeples that are adjacent to each other. So that's why you can see those dashed lines in between spots on the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll score points depending on how big that section is of base camps. So then the animal abilities are going to be stuff like exchanging the the space of an animal and a meeple on the the mountain. Moving the hiker. Yeah, moving the hiker. And the game ends once a player has placed either all of their scoring cubes out or all of their hikers. And then whoever has most points wins. So that is Nunga Parbat in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Uh, I liked it. Uh, it was enjoyable. Uh, is where it ranks amongst my Steve Finn games. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it's not. It's definitely not a Biblios level. That's the one that I really, <laughs> really enjoyed. Biblios. Biblios is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, uh, it's good. Uh, I think it is clever, but um, there was a little bit of saminess after a while because you're literally doing this like mountain move the hiker get the animal collect the animal mm-hmm. now it's your turn back and forth back and forth so there wasn't as much depth in what you were doing in that mm-hmm. game if that mm-hmm. makes sense uh but overall an enjoyable experience yeah i totally agree i think it does it does lack a little bit of the depth that we appreciate in some of the other uh dr finn's games mm-hmm. because we, we do really enjoy dr finn's games in this household yep. but uh it's a nice kind of like versatile game i guess they can play in just 30 minutes like mm-hmm. hey we have 30 minutes you want to play a game let's do this one it doesn't take too much out of you and it's enjoyable in the moment yes, right exactly so to me it feels like a pretty clean design but uh for long-term enjoyment it doesn't feel like it has necessarily that staying power mm. for the long term i will say it is a pretty easy rule set uh it's very easy to understand what you're trying to do and what you're Mm -hmm. trying to accomplish especially with scoring criteria up in that top left corner Uh, this is a game that i can definitely uh, play with my family Uh, so for that reason i think we're going to hang on to it for a little bit longer and that's nunga parbat designed by dr stephen all right next up we have another abstract strategy game and this is probably one of the more unassuming games Mm -hmm. yet Yeah, this is one that uh, was highly recommended by a lot of people, and so we finally got to play it. Mm -hmm. It is called Shobu. Shobu is designed by Manolis Renes and Jamie Sejdak. I do apologize if I've mispronounced those names, and it's published by (laughs) Smirk and Laughter Games. Uh, We got this game at PAX Unplugged uh, 2021. Highly recommended by a lot of people, and so, um, you know, I I knew nothing about this game other than it was highly recommended. Yeah. 
We it's, saw the box and we were like, really? Yeah. <laughs> what what is going on here? Yeah. Like, what's the? It's a bunch. It's like rocks. It's, it's rocks. Literally and rocks and wood. wooden boards and yep. a rope. Yep. That's what you're gonna get in this box. For that reason, by the way, it's heavy, uh, heavier than Physically it looks. Heavy, yeah. But um, this is two player only abstract game. It feels like a design that's been carried down for generations. It does. Right. Yes. Uh, and, and the basic premise here is, you know, you have the board set up in four in a, a square formation mm -hmm. with two of the dark boards on one side and then the other two lighter boards on the other side with the rope splitting down the middle. Yep. One player is playing as the black stones, the other player is the white stones, and you're basically trying to knock off all four of your opponent's stones from one board. Yeah, from one of the four boards, Up to who, the game. whoever can do that is the winner. Yes, but the, the way in which you do it is really tough. Because on your turn, you're going to be taking two actions. The first action can only be done, I think it's only be done on one of your two home boards. On one of your two home boards. Which are the boards that are closest to you. Yeah, you can move either one or two spaces mm -hmm. on your home board. Yes, in any direction that, that is legal, yep. essentially. And then after you take that first move, you do a more aggressive move, which is basically the exact same move you made, but on one of the two boards of the opposite color. That's right. So if your first move was on the darker brown board, then your second move has to be on the, the lighter boards. Yep. And only in that second move are you allowed to actually push your opponent's pieces. That's right. Because yeah. the first move, you can't you can't do any pushing. Yeah, the first move, if there's a rock that's one space away from you and you want to move two spaces to be able to push it, you're not allowed to. Yeah. You're just going to stop dead at that rock. So yes. that means your next programmed move, which would be on the opposite color, can only move one space because you only legally moved one space. So right. this game is really about positioning yourself so that that second move, that programmed move, can really get somebody to uh, put them in harm's way and push yeah. them off the board. And you also want to plan that first passive move, is what it's called, yep. uh, so that you properly position yourself for future turns, because mm -hmm. that is something that I am really terrible at in this game. Yeah, you need to set yourself up so that you are taking a good second action, uh, yeah. that aggressive action, but also making sure that you... you uh, anticipate what the threats are when it's the opponent's turn. Right. How exposed am I by putting that one out there? Yeah. You want to move a stone, push your opponent off, and then be able to push your opponent off again yeah. in the following turn, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it is super abstract. It is really difficult for me to wrap my head around it, but <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's this really good. This is a fantastic abstract game. I, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah. I, I really like the element of like, I'm willing to sacrifice this stone because I know by me sacrificing the stone, I'm going to get two of yours off for my one. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of that going on in this game. Navigating around, positioning yourself, uh, and just trying to strategically plan. Uh, it's it's very simple uh, yeah. what's happening in this game, but super very elegant the way it's played. Yeah, super elegant design. And this game has the depth that we're usually looking for. Yeah. Uh, you know, it has such a simple turn structure, very unassuming look to it. You mm -hmm. know, the no bells and whistles, no theme, just no color, <laughs> yeah. just mechanics. Right. And in the in that simple design is so much depth. And for mm -hmm. that reason, we really, 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 really love this game. Mm -hmm. If you love two player abstract strategy games, this is a no brainer. Definitely highly recommend you check it out. Yeah, which is strange because I'm not the biggest abstract strategy player. Yeah. But, um, no, you hate abstract games. You don't like them. Hate. Wow. Hate. <laughs> hate is a very strong, hate is a strong word. word. That's not true. It's just I, I like to find ones like this yeah. that, that are very enjoyable. And so this one is uh, no exception. This one is fantastic. This might be up there for me. Like uh, one of your favorite abstract games. One of my favorite games. abstract strategy games. Yeah, this one is really, a good really one. Good. And so that is Shobu. Very heavy. <laughs> All right, we have two more games left. The next one comes to us from Keymaster Games. Yes. And it is a two-player only game called... Uh, this is Caper Europe, which is based off of the original Caper, which we had not played no. before. This one is designed by Unai Rubio, and it takes about 30 minutes to play. Yes, and it's the same designer as the um, original Caper mm -hmm. that was published in like 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. A couple years but ago. Same publisher. And you might be familiar with the publisher. You know, they, they put out games like Parks, probably the most popular game, yep. right? Parks and Trails, which is the one after that. Mm -hmm. And so this time, this is a two-player uh, drafting and area control experience. Mm -hmm. It's a tug-of-war game. It's a tug-of-war, yeah. yes. If the game is played over the course of, I think, six rounds... And there's a board in the middle that has three different locations, and the locations are going to vary depending on which location you choose to play with. Some of them are harder, some of them are easier. Every other round, players are going to be drafting a hand of thieves, because this is a caper. Your mm -hmm. thieves are going to these locations and trying to steal stuff, right? Yep. And then every other round, you're going to be drafting gear cards and equipping your thieves with gear. Each location also has this tracker that at the end of the game, depending on if it's closer to you or closer to your opponent, you'll be able to acquire or, or gain control of that location card, which will score you points. And, and each location card also has a different kind of end game scoring criteria. Mm -hmm. yep. 
that you both might be building towards. Yeah, so, and so you're uh -huh. going to be trying to prioritize like, oh man, that I really like what's going on in the middle. It's, oh, Monique has played a card there. I need to counteract that. So that's kind of that tug of war on mm -hmm. that track that we're talking about. Right. And so the Thieve cards are going to do various actions for you, but they're also going to potentially give you additional end game scoring criteria. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if I put a Thief in a location, it might give me one point at the end of the game for every purple gear card, stuff like that. And so that's going to kind of drive the way that you play gear cards. But the thing about gear cards is you have to pay for them. Mm -hmm. There's there's currency in this game that you earn by putting out thieves, and then you have to pay to put out gear cards. Right, right. I don't know if that synopsis was explained very well, but that is the basic premise of the game. In usual Key Master Games fashion, this game is beautiful. Very, like the nice. artwork, the component quality, there's an insert, you know, it's just like it's kind of what you expect to see now from Keymaster. Keymaster, you set a really high bar for yourself. Yeah, right, right when you pull off that box cover and you look in it, it just feels like luxury and premium. Yes, yeah, definitely. Very, very nice. Really, really, really good, nice look to the game. Uh, gameplay itself is fairly light. So if you want something that's a little bit more uh, gateway or entry level in terms of uh, specifically drafting and tug of war area control mechanics, then this is definitely it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very similar to Parks and Trails, how that's kind of like um, a lighter like worker placement game. I guess I suppose that's worker placement. Yeah. If you if you enjoy Parks for that level of strategy, then you will most likely enjoy Caper for mm -hmm. the same reason mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you did not enjoy Parks because maybe you felt like it was a little bit too light, then you might not enjoy Caper. Maybe not, yeah. Although Caper does have more depth than Park, for sure. It does. Park for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the plays. There are other scenarios that introduce different types of cards, so there's a little bit more variability in the mm -hmm. game. Um, it was an enjoyable experience. Uh, was it my like favorite amongst all the games that we're talking about? Probably not, because I just gushed over Shobu. Uh, <laughs> but I but I did enjoy this game, and uh, just just for the components alone and, and the box size, this is one that I think we're going to hang on to for a little while because it is such a beautiful game. If you want different mechanics, like you you love playing games with your parents, yeah. so this is probably one that you would bring over there to introduce these new types of uh -huh, mechanics. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> But in terms of the strategy, when we play this game together, I do feel like the str the decision making is not as crunchy. It's not something that I'm like gonna pour my brain over, yep. which is something that we look for in a mm -hmm. two player only sure. game. Yep. That's Caper, Caper Europe. Europe. All right, and last but not least, we have a game that is probably the most heartbreaking for me. <laughs> it's another abstract strategy game, two player only, and it is called War Chest. War Chest. So this game was published in like 2018. This is this is not new. It's been around. It's uh, published by AEG, mm -hmm. and it's designed by I believe two designers, Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. Mm -hmm. And this this box is heavy because inside of it are a bunch of of uh, coins. Yep. They're heavy. They're really really good quality like coins. Like poker chip coins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> These are the coins. They're like poker chips. They're very, very sturdy. And, very good uh, quality. And heavy. Very good quality, mm -hmm. yes. And the basic premise here is this is a war game. Mm -hmm. There is a board in the middle of the table, and I believe you can play this at four as well. I think but so. But I think it's designed specifically for the two-player uh, game in mind. Mm -hmm. And you're basically just trying to put out all of your control markers onto the board. There are only certain spaces on the board where they can go. At the start of the game, each player is given four cards, and those cards correspond to one of the different types of of coins in here. Yeah, stack of coins. Stack of coins. Mm -hmm. Some of them have four of them, some of them have five total. Yep. Um, and these are going to be your your army, essentially. But they're all asymmetric in terms of what they can do, what their special ability is. So some of them can move further when they take a move. Some of them can move and then attack. Some can attack and then move. Some have range attack. If you have one type of coin, uh, your opponent will not have that specific type of coin. Yes, they're all unique. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the gameplay, the way that it works is during setup, each player is going to take two coins from each of their stacks mm -hmm. and place them in a bag because it's kind of it's kind of a bag builder. Yep. At the start of each round, players are going to draw three of those coins to form their hand for the round. And when you take a turn, you're either going to uh, play one of those coins onto the board in one of the spots that allow you to spawn people, mm -hmm. or you can discard a coin from your hand to be able to take an action with that corresponding coin that's already on the board. Mm -hmm. It's really tough and minimalistic in that sense, because in order for you to be able to take several actions with one specific type of soldier, essentially on mm -hmm. the board, you have to have those coins in your hand 
yes. to discard. Meaning in right? previous turns, you would have had to have bag built to get those coins into the bag so that when you pull them out, you have access to moving that particular type of soldier around right. on the board to do whatever they need to do. And if you want to get more coins into your bag, then you have to discard a coin from your hand face down. That's right. So, Which means you're not using that coin to either deploy a new troop or to move uh, your soldier on the board. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you can only have one of each type on the board at any given time. That's right, yep. I think that this game is really interesting. I actually really, really love it. And it's heartbreaking because how do you feel, Naveen? I, Tell them all. Okay, so the first time we played, we went with the intro scenario. Is that what yes. it was? Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Where you don't get to draft your army. Yeah. These are the, these, I was just designated, these are the four. And I felt like mine was just not as strong as yours. When we played it again and we actually drafted, once we saw all the opportunities or all the possibilities, I was able to kind of curate a better kind of overall army. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like my intro, uh, just my moves were not as strong as some of yours. I might have had more coins, but I would take one less coin to be able to do something cooler. Yeah, we basically opened up the rule book and there's a, a suggestion, a starting setup for your first game. If you're player one, you use these four factions. If you're player two, you use these mm -hmm. four. And I agree. I felt like one of the players is not as strong as the other. The way that yeah. you're supposed to do it is you literally just shuffle the cards and you just deal out four. You oh, just deal wow. them out yeah. four, four. You don't even draft. But so what we decided to do is we laid out, I think, nine, nine cards. cards yeah. uh -huh. And then we did kind of like a dodgeball team building thing where we alternated and, and drafted yeah. our armies. Yeah, because it's nice to have those archers that can that, uh, can hit from, from far away, mm -hmm. uh, from like two spaces away. Because if, if you were, let's say you were to have two archers and I had these like slow moving just mm -hmm. because that's what was dealt to me. That could be really, really frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And, and I definitely can see how this game is frustrating. It is. It is. This is a very frustrating game because of how minimalistic it is. Mm -hmm. It's de it's definitely a war game, but when you play war games, you're used to having like uh, so many movement points or just action point allowance almost, yep. like right. Yep. Um, or even when you play chess, like chess is definitely a faster moving, more aggressive game. Mm -hmm. This is a slow burn. You need to acquire the coins. You need to bag bag build mm -hmm. and take the proper coins of which uh, which types of troops you want to deploy the most or utilize the most, and you want to do it at the right time. And there's still that luck of okay, well, I'm going to draw three from my bag. I don't know which three are going to come up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, one of the more frustrating parts of the game for me would be uh, if I set somebody up, I set up the bag, and then I couldn't defend that that uh, army uh, unit that's now on the board. They get killed. Now I have a bag full of these these things. Mm -hmm. So now I have to spend one of them to put them right back out but then now they're back in harm's way uh so that that happened to me the first couple times so it kind of left us a little bit of a sour taste uh but we did play it again with the drafting and then uh from now on i think that's the only way we're going to play so my appreciation for the game kind of like triple folded uh mm -hmm. after we did the draft uh, when i was just designated these are your units i was like i don't really like this game for that reason but yeah. with the draft much much better but still not that great still <laughs> not, it's not shobu let's just put it that way that that tripled in experience was tripling a very low first experience <laughs> for Nivian, right. So, but for me i really love this game um it's it's very different there's no, we don't have anything like it i don't think i've ever played anything like it but i really love it for the asymmetry the variability the replayability i just think it's it's so great and it's so hard and i think that challenge is is another thing that kind of pulls me in mm. i really love war chess there's also two expansions that came out in recent years we have one of them here it's called nobility i believe the other one is called siege mm. i've played from both but i don't remember which ones were from which uh in, in my opinion i think they just make the game better because it just adds even more options more for variety. you uh, yeah. but they do add uh, extra mechanics that make the gameplay a little bit more interesting anyway that is war chest uh component quality amazing and uh but gameplay very limiting but very good well there you have it those are five different games that Monique and I have been playing recently so of the five for yeah, what's me, your favorite for me I, I obviously based off the way I, I spoke about it Shobu for sure okay of the five how about yourself Ooh, you tough. Shobu honest. is very good uh, but I think it might be War Chess yeah I really 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 like War Chess and uh, I think the more so plays I have at it the more I I will enjoy it I hope so I think so <laughs> I, I don't want to keep it around I don't think it's going to go the opposite way I think my enjoyment of it will only grow versus okay. you know kind of kind of wane if that makes sense we'll keep you updated yeah well thank you all so much for watching our video stay tuned for the rest of the week we have a couple of kickstarter tutorials coming out as well as hopefully a long playthrough coming up by the end of the week a dense one yes thank you so much if you all like these kind of videos and you want to see more in the future please consider subscribing thanks, thanks. bye